And uh, I'm, I'm excited about the message today. If you have a Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, it's not the passage that most, uh, that most kids want to turn to. Uh, and you'll find out here in a little bit because they get it quoted to them all the time. Now, I don't know about you, but, um, you know, when you haven't done something or when you're new at something, you have a lot of advice for people. How many are with me? Let me help you. When I was new as a pastor, I started off as a volunteer, um, and, then, um, and then they brought me on as an intern, and then I proved myself as an intern, so I got part-time, and then I got hired full-time, and they hired me full-time as one of the staff pastors, and I thought I was big time. I said, where's my office going to be? And they said, up to the up to the left part of the stage, there's a little room. I said, that's where the women's baptistry room is. And they said, yep, we're going to find a desk for you and put you one of those phones. Remember they used to have landlines? Remember the landlines? And you got the intercom, and I could talk to the other pastors or the secretary at the church, you know? And uh, so and I started, you know, I mean, they, they gave me a lot of responsibility out of the very beginning. I mean, when I started full-time, I was over our children's ministry, I was over college and career. Um, I was over our outreach, which was 20 hours a week, knocking on doors and letting people know uh, who Jesus was. And then I was also over lawn care. <laughs> so we had uh, seven acres, and I had to cut that. And, I didn't, and nobody had taught me about delegation yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I was, I was getting pretty tired. And, but I was like, you know what? And they gave me a lot of responsibility. I, I remember my first counseling appointment. I've got my little office up here. And so Pastor Otis calls me on the intercom. Hey, can you come to my office? So I grab my notebook and my pen. And I march to his office. And I wait for the secretary to let me in. And she lets me in. And I go in. And he goes, hey, I've got a counseling deal that I need you to do. I'm like, okay. And he's like, so I get involved in this counseling deal. The first counseling deal that I do is with this couple. And the husband's having an affair on the wife, and she's talking, or sorry, the wife was having the affair on the husband, and I can't remember which way it was. This has been over 20 years ago. I mean, this is a long time ago. All right, this has been back before the Civil War, okay? <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I'm not that old. I, I, don't, I don't remember, but the whole point was I was counseling them through this, and I'm like, what am I doing? Like, I just got out of Bible college. I've just been married for, like, not very, like, We've been married for like 30 minutes, and, uh, and, and so they gave me a lot of responsibility. And so, you know, I started walking around the church as a young pastor, and I started thinking, you know what, uh, I think if the pastor, I think I need to go talk to the pastor. He needs to listen to me because I think I could change some stuff around here. I think, I think he's a, he's a, listen, just bottom line. I got some stuff I need to say to him because I think he needs to listen to me because I could really help him on his leadership. Now, I did not have the relationship with my boss, nor have I ever, where I would walk in and tell them how they should do things. And I'm so thankful that I didn't because I would have been really wrong and really fired and my family and I would be in, living in a tent. Okay? So then I remember being a, uh, 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 not even a parent, like we were, Linda and I'd be dating and we'd be like walking through Price Chopper, Walmart and I'd whisper to her and I'd be like, our kids will never, no, 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 you don't understand. They will, they will never act like that or I will take them home. <laughs> Some people are like, I don't believe in spanking. Good. I believe in spanking and timeout. Yeah. All right? <laughs> so, so check it out. I thought, man, my kids are never going to act like that. If you've ever said that before you had kids, raise your hand. God bless you. I said, hold your hands up. By, I'm a, God bless you and you and you and you and you. And hands are going up all over. They're raising hands online. This is a great sermon. Okay. If you've ever been like that, you know that it's funny. Uh, I've noticed this with working out and, and eating right. Uh, <clears throat> people that give me advice. Like, I'm pretty public. I like to be public um, about what I'm doing because it, there's accountability there. 
So I'll be like, hey, I'm working out, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And people, they'll get with me and go, hey, what you really need to do is cut out all the sugar. And I'm looking at them knowing that they're not cutting out all the sugar. They're eating all the sugar. They want me to not eat sugar so they can have more. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, bro, I mean, you're going to give me advice, but you're not, you're not, you're not taking it. An another one was, uh, well, since maybe some of the Raytown guys are watching, uh, so I do a couple different things. Um, and one of the things that I do is, is, is fire and police chaplain. And so I was at Raytown one time, uh, and working, uh, on one of their shifts and, um, so after dinner, things get a little wild if they don't get a call. And uh, you know that deal, right? But we won't tell the chiefs about that because <laughs> they won't be around. But uh, <clears throat> so some of the young guys were like, you know, trying to act like they're all that. And I was like, bro, I'll take you on in a push-up contest. <laughs> and the guy's like 25, 26. And so I'm like, yeah. I mean, who, who, you and I, I said, come here, Funk. So I was like, Funk, you watch. And you count, tell us when the minute starts, and whoever can do the most push-ups in a minute wins. He beat me by two. He, I did as many push-ups as he did. He just beat me by two, but he won. But I'm surprised you're not clapping right now because he was 25 and I'm 50. 50. I'm 50. All right? And so... You know, uh, it's funny because I'll tell people about push-ups. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to do push-ups and stuff. And they're like, well, what you need to do is you need to keep your butt kind of low and you can't put it high and you got to do this and you got to do, and you got to have the right form. And I'm like, oh yeah? When was the last time you did a push-up? I've never. But I saw on YouTube or TikTok the other day, I was clicking through. Anybody ever had people do that? See, here's the reality. And dads, I want to talk to you today, but it's actually going to apply to everybody. But I want, I want to talk to the fathers in the room. The reality is that being a father is challenging at best. I remember uh, I, my wife uh, told the story on Mother's Day, which, by the way, my wife did a great job. She had the most views of any, probably any video that we've been watched recently. Uh, on her message on, fa on Mother's Day. I almost had her just preach that same message on Father's Day. Nobody would know the difference. <laughs> and um, so my uh, wife finds out she's pregnant. At the time, I was going to Bible college full-time, carrying, it was 18 hours a week I was carrying, working part-time at Seasonal Concepts, selling Christmas trees on the holidays and patio furnitures uh, in the summertime. And then... I was working part-time at the church, okay? Well, it's why I never feel sorry for college students that complain, working 18 hours a week and working a part-time job. Don't feel sorry for you. It, you. You can do it. What you have to do is you just don't have a life. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Can I get an amen yes. from some people that have done that before? Well, I'm carrying 18 hours. I do that in a day. <laughs> you better get over yourself. Uh, but so I remember getting out to my car. She told the story. I got out to my candy apple red Beretta. We closed at nine, got out there about 930, you know, get the cash till and everything counted, get out, get in my car. And I'm like, huh, before cell phones. Well, cell phones were starting to come out, but the rich people could only talk on cell phones. I had a fake cell phone that I talked on the cell phone on in my car, a plastic one, you know, because I couldn't afford it. It was like a dollar 49 a minute. How many remember those days? All right, I'm really sounding old now. <laughs> so I'm like, there's booties. Like, white, blue, and then there's a card. And she opened the card. I'm going to be a father. I'm like, I don't know what I should do right now. I don't know if I should run. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I was so nervous, and here's why. Because the responsibility of a father is challenging at best. It can be confusing. How many fathers would agree with me? And I wouldn't say it could be a little confusing. It can be a lot confusing. Now, let me set the record straight. If you're a guest with this and you don't know, you don't know me, you think, well, he must be like a preacher boy and his dad was a preacher and his grandfather was a preacher and his great-great-grandfather and he grew up in the church. Wrong. Nah. All right. 
never knew my real father. Um, we started talking several years before he passed, um, but never met him personally that I can recall. Um, so if you grew up with a father in the home, even if he wasn't the greatest example, you had more of an example than I had. So what I had to draw off of was my mentors and the little interactions that I would have with their families and watching how they would parent. And you know that the little interactions you're gonna get with people is not gonna be the whole enchilada. You know what I'm saying? Like you're not gonna see really the, the real stuff, all right? And so it was challenging. And what I wanna do is I wanna read a passage of scripture and I wanna to talk to you um, from a message that I've titled today, and I've never done a message on this before, <laughs> probably because uh, it's taken me uh, a long time to learn this. Uh, relational parenting, relational parenting. So Ephesians chapter six, uh, the apostle Paul said in verse one, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother when they deserve it. No. Oh, I didn't say that, huh? Huh. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. Look at what the promise is. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So I want to give you some of what I've learned. And so part of what I've learned, I learned it later on in life. One of the things I love about being a grandparent is I feel like it's called, uh, I call it second chance parenting. It's one of the books that I want to write. Um, second chance parenting because you get a second chance at it. And, uh, but what I want to do is just teach you some of what I've learned and, and, if there's one thing that I could do over again, it'd be being a father. Like if I could turn time back, I would turn that back. <clears throat> Let me give you some phases. Phase one. I and you as the parent you decide what the kid's going to do. Now, we don't sometimes understand this today because I see people asking their one-year-old, honey, what do you want to wear? Do you want to wear this or do you want to wear this? They don't know. You choose. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't give them a choice. Well, what do you want to eat? Do you want broccoli or do you want McDonald's? Duh. Broccoli all the way. <laughs> uh, phase two is we, parent and child, talk, and I, the parent, decide. Phase two is we, the parent and the child, we're going to talk. I'm going to talk them through uh, uh, kind of what we're doing, but then I'm going to make the decision as the parent. And then phase three, we talk. The parent decides, or excuse me, the child decides and if their decision is too dangerous, then I decide. <laughs> How many know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like, this starts to get up into the teenage years, all right? And then if you're like, ah, I think that's a little too dangerous, then I'm going to make the decision of what you're going to do. And then phase four is you decide, the child decides, and we talk only if you ask to talk. And this phase is to be reached before each child's uh, last year at home. So that's the phases. And the, what is the goal of the phases? Let's keep them up there for a minute. What, what is the goal of all of the phases? Is it getting them to follow your authority because you're the boss? If I had a dime for every time, and it was something that my, my mom's generation said, do as I say and not as I do. Or is it getting their heart to want to follow because they know that you want the best for them? I want everybody to write this next thing down. And if you're a parent, you should write it down. If you don't, Jesus can't even help you. Write this down. 
Got it? Get a pen and paper, get a phone out, talk to your neighbor, call a friend, put them on speakerphone, tell them to write this down. Delegate it if you have to. You ready? Thank you. One person's listening. <laughs> this is awkward. Rules without relationships equals rebellion. Rules without relationships equals rebellion. See, parenting with only positional authority often results in radical, radical rebellion. And I've seen parents... And when I was a younger parent, I would see parents, and, and, and I still see parents, and, and their kids, it's like, it's like the military. Yes, sir! And they got perfect look little kids. Used to impress me. Now, it is impressive. Your kids do what you want them to do. What's even more impressive is when they get to the point where they can choose for themselves, and they still choose to do right despite the rules. See, rules without relationship equals rebellion. This happens in Christianity all the time. Somebody um, becomes all about following the rules of the Scriptures instead of having a relationship with the Father. Yeah. Amen. And then they think that He's just out to get them. Well, God is a joy stopper. He doesn't want me to do this or He doesn't want me to do that. It's just... He doesn't, he doesn't really love me because we don't see him as a relationship. We see him as this, this dictator. See, I wish I would have learned this next part, what I'm going to teach you. And those of you that are parents, even if you messed up, you can still make it right. And we'll talk about that. Here, here it is. The goal in parenting is to shepherd the heart, not the behavior. And here's the deal. Gang, listen to me. We say yes to this, but we're not used to this. Because what we want to change is the behavior. Stop acting like that. My wife and I made a lot of mistakes. I should say I made a lot of mistakes in parenting. The, one of the things, we did several things right. Uh, and really right. One of the things we did right is we knew that being a pastor, we were going to live in the bubble, in the glass house. And so when our kids got old enough to where they could have conversations with us, we already had conversations that we were never and we never. And when I say never, there are some things that I, there are many things I can't say never about. This is I can say never. We never uh, went to our kids and say, stop acting like that. You're a pastor's son. That never came out of our mouths. In fact, we taught them. We would say things like, listen, the pinions don't act like that because we're following Jesus. It had nothing to do with my job. Nothing. And we've lost people from this church because they were being critical of my kids. We've had people follow us around in restaurants and send me mail. I was watching you at Jose Peppers, for real. You ought to be, you ought to, you're a disgrace. You ought to quit the ministry. I saw you and you yelling at your kid. You know, just people being dumb. We taught our kids, hey, the reason why you don't behave that way is because we're the pinions and we're Jesus followers. And we, but, but here's the problem. I was so about has a, and I want you to hear me, men, I was a young, angry, young man and a young father. So, so, so I'm not up here by myself, y'all looking at me, all right? How many men can identify? Give me some house lights. Give me some full house lights. Don't hide those house lights. All right, there you go, all right? How many men can understand what I'm talking about? Thank you. Thank you for joining me. All right, ladies, I want you to know that if that's your husband, there's hope. You can ask my wife pound my fist. I wanted my, I wanted my kids to know, by God, I said it and that's the way it's going to be. And one time, this is a funny story. I haven't told this story for a long time. One time, we used to have a, we, we play cards a lot. 
and on our table, we had this pad that would fold out on the table to play cards and it was padded. And we had the tablecloth to get um, across there, but my wife had removed the pad and I got mad at one of our boys and I took my fist and I just shoved it down. I was thinking I was gonna hit the pad and I didn't. And it was my shaking hand, all right? And for the next six weeks at church, I would start to go like this. I'd be like, nah, I got to, what happened to your hand? <laughs> oh, nothing. <laughs> Just doing a little construction around the house. And no, I, you know what I did? And some of you might remember, I just told people, I said, I got mad, slammed my fist on the, uh, slammed my fist and acted like a child on the table. And I learned my lesson and their face would go, oh, <laughs> Sometimes it'd be new people to the church because I'm like, I'm not going to hide it. Like, that's what happened. That's what happened a lot in our household. I had a lot of growing up to do. And there was times where I wanted my kids, my boys, our boys, to obey me because I was their father. I wish somebody would have told me early on, it doesn't work that way. Rules without relationships equals rebellion. The goal of parenting is to shepherd the heart, not the behavior. Don't worry. Listen, this is going to sound really bad. Especially if they're a teenager, stop worrying about the behavior. Listen to me. I want to come down here. Look at me. Stop worrying about the behavior. Well, I just want them to stop. Stop smoking this. Stop hanging out with these people. Stop doing this. If they would just, so if they would just stop, then you'd be fine. Yes, I'd be fine. Well, what happens if they stop because their heart still is inclined to that, but they don't want to, they don't want to get in trouble by you. So when they become adults, they're going to go do that. Are you okay with that? I wish I'd have learned this that the goal is to shepherd the heart because when I change the heart, then the behavior changes. Look at what 1 Samuel says, 1 Samuel 16. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the high or of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the what? The Lord looks on the heart. Fathers, listen, be more concerned about your son and your daughter's heart than you are their behavior because from their heart flows their behavior. Not from their behavior flows their heart. You can see a reflection of their heart in their behavior. And th th our staff, we had our um, counselor come in and talk to our staff about some of the issues that are going on in culture uh, this last week for about two hours. And it was a pretty deep conversation. And one of, the things I, one of the points I made to our staff is I'm tired of being a part of churches. And I don't feel like LifeQuest is as much like this, but sometimes it can creep up every once in a while where we're trying to change people's behavior. If they just knew that the Bible said it's wrong, Okay, so if they knew that, they, that the Bible said it's wrong, which by the way, we spend more time in the church trying to get unchurched people, people that don't know Jesus, to change. No, they need to come to know Jesus. And when they come to know Jesus, over time, they will change. They don't change and then come to know Jesus. Or Jesus showed us the wrong way to do it with the woman at the well then. Because <laughs> he wasn't concerned about her behavior and he knew all about it. And so what we got to be careful about is that we don't get so hung up on the behavior that we miss the heart. See, we think from the heart, we feel from the heart, we pray in our hearts, we have inclinations in our heart, we have desires in our heart, we have glad hearts, we have sad hearts, the list goes on and on. In other words, everything that happens in your life from your thoughts and your actions comes from the what? heart. And look at what Jesus did. This is how Jesus did it. John chapter one, verse 14. John chapter one is where Jesus, the, John is talking about Jesus is God, but he was man. And in the flesh, he was the word that, you know, and so 
he says, John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word, which is Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of, say it with me, online and in person, full of grace and truth. Say it with me, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. Good job, Devin. Full of grace and truth. See, grace is undeserved favor. Grace is you can't earn it and you can't buy it, but I'm going to give it to you. And, and I've learned, I've got to graciously love my boys even if I don't agree with the behavior. I'm going to give them grace. Well, don't you, you need to let them know that's wrong. Do you want God to treat you like that? Do you want God to take a sledgehammer? How many of you in the room have, um, there is a sin in your life that you know that it's a sin and you've committed it over a hundred times? Everybody ought to have their hand up. Do you want, do you want, do you want God to bust you over the head? Or do you want him to give you Grace. Now, now, I love what Hal Perkins, Hal Perkins is the father of David Perkins. David Perkins started Radiant Church. Hal is his dad, and Hal wrote a book called, uh, let me see what the name of the book is called. If Jesus Were a Parent. Oh, it's powerful. And in this book, If Jesus Were a Parent, Hal Perkins, and I've met Hal, such a great guy. He studies a lot. He's an older guy, uh, and he studies a lot at... Um, um, Starbucks and, and uh, Panera here in Belton. He said, parents must train their child to avoid both legalism. I grew up legalism. I grew up with legalism. Do you guys know what legalism is? Legalism is, I'm going to walk the right way. I'm going to, everything was about, you're going to dress like a good Christian. You're going to act like a good Christian. You're not going to listen to any music with a beat. I mean, listen, all of the music that we play in church today, I would be going, they would be telling me I'd be going to hell if I listened to it. All right. You remember this? If you back mask it, he's going to say, the devil's going to get you. The devil's going to get you. The devil's coming after you. All right? And so everything was about if you behave and then you, couldn't tuck, you could not untuck your shirt in those days. If you untucked your shirt, it was a sign of disrespect. And so you had on a pair of dockers. And if you had a polo on, you had it tucked in. And you look like a good Christian boy and girl. You just, you just look good. It's interesting because you study a lot of pastors back in those ages, in those, those times. <laughs> Sound like I'm really old. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead and laugh at me. <laughs> I'll let you come up here and preach. <laughs> but uh, in those times, it's interesting because uh, when the pastors would end up falling morally, people were like, Well, he always had a nice suit on and he always had his Bible and he always knew what to say and he never hung out with the wrong people. And Do you see where legalism, legalism is about the behavior? Yeah. Yeah. Hal Perkins said, parents must train their child to avoid both legalism and cheap grace. I don't want to give cheap grace to my kids either. Cheap grace is, oh, honey, I know you messed up, but it's going to be okay. It's going to be fine. Uh, I know there's consequences. I'm going to take care of that for you. Don't do that. Hal said, they dare not tolerate willful disobedience nor create a you're loved if you perform well mindset. So truth is my principles that I live by. I have grace and what? Truth. truth. So I have grace. I want grace. And then there's truth. There's truth that I live by. The truth is that you broke the law or you went against what we said and there's going to be consequences. And then this is how you talk to your child or your teenager. You say, honey, I am so sorry that you chose to go against our curfew. I know, but it was only five minutes. I understand. But we told you past 1030 it's 1036, six minutes. And my friend, listen, we're not talking about your friends right now. I am so sorry you chose and the consequence is 
you're going to lose this or you're going to do this. You chose a consequence, but here's the deal. I'm here to love you. I'm not here to criticize you. Dad knows it hurts. I don't want to have to do this, but you chose. So I'm given grace and I'm given truth. And if you do the right punishment, the punishment is enough. I wish I would have learned that as a young man instead of yelling and screaming and acting like you know what, a hyena, the wrong person. I should not have acted like that. That was not good. And so here's my question. If you don't shepherd your child's heart, who will establish an obedient heart in your child? Will it be the TV or their phone that they spend more time with than you? Will it be TikTok? Or YouTube, will it be the movies or will it be their friends? Will it be school or will it be Kids Quest? Will they become closer to the Kids Quest workers than they become to you? Because you, they get more FaceTime for an hour on Sunday than they get FaceTime with you ever during the week? Ah, man, I'm not feeling good right now. I think I got to go. I got to go home. Just hang tight. The same time. Here's the big idea. To parent as God does, we establish relational authority. So how can fathers build relational authority with their children? Let me give you three ideas. There's, there's more, but I'll just give you a three. It's what I've learned. Number one, experiencing the grace of God personally. Guys, listen. Men. I'm going to come down there because I, 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 want, I want men. I want you to look me in the face. I want you to look me in the eye. I want you to understand I'm talking to you man to man that if you don't experience God's grace personally, you can't give what you've never gotten. You can't give what you've never received. I want to give a million dollars to each of my boys before I die. I don't, I don't have a million dollars. So you can't give it. So experiencing the grace of God personally. I've got, to, I've, got to, I've got to experience God's grace. And that means I've got to come to the point where I realize I am screwed up and I am broken. I'm a broken man. And I need to be healed. And I've made mistakes with my boys and with my wife. And I've got to go to them and say, would you forgive me and be specific? Well, I don't think I could ever do that. I mean, my dad never did that. I remind you, neither did mine. See, when we receive the grace of God, we see ourselves as wanted and valued in spite of our imperfections and weaknesses. Uh, Romans 5, 8 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ what? He died for us. Christ led and he still leads with my heavenly father. He still leads with the relational authority. He's not beating me over the head and going, Pinion, you're gonna learn to behave now. Come on, son. There's so much I want more for you. You can do it. Let's dig deep. Oh, that anger, where's that anger coming from? Let's dig deeper. I'll never be healed fully and perfect <laughs> this side of eternity, but I can tell you this. I challenge you to go ask my, my boys or my wife. She was at the first service and she'll tell you the truth too. When was the last time dad got angry? I can't remember. If you would have asked me seven, eight years ago, probably within the last 24 hours. I did something dumb one time. I, I, just trying to get you men to warm up to me because you're looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. My, my wife bought me this Yeti cup, orange Yeti, big Yeti. You know what I'm talking about? Yetis are not cheap. Yeah. And I got mad one time over something stupid. I think, 
I think Caden was trying to tease me on something. I was on the phone and I took it and I just slammed it down. It's still in our cabinet. It's got a big old dent. So now every time I pull that thing out and my boys are there, they're like, hey, dad, why is your Yeti got a dent in it? <laughs> but you know, <laughs> I only tell you that because I'm trying to lead with vulnerability because I'm trying to get some of you men to realize that it's okay to admit you're broken. It's okay. See, number two, to build a relational authority with your children, number two, you got to be proactive, kind, proactively kind and sensitive. You got to be sensitive to what's going on with them. Love does what it believes to be best for the, the one that's loved, and I've got to spend time. And so that's number three, taking the time to invest in the relationship. Men, listen to me. As an empty nester, I can tell you, there's going to be plenty of time for you to work. To work over, to work long hours. Okay? I'm in a season right now where it's funny. I love the reactions of people when they hear what I do. And, but I feel fulfilled in life. Like I, I, I feel like I could go another 20, 30 years being a pastor because I'm doing multiple things and it's just who I am. You know, it's just how God's wired me. I don't like that. I mean, I want to rewire you. No, get back. <laughs> don't touch my wiring. If my wife starts saying something, then, then we got a deal, okay? But listen, I screwed up in the early years. I was a workaholic. A lot of regret. And can I tell you something? I wish I'd have learned this. You can always earn more money. You can earn more money. If, if you're in America, legally, you can earn a lot of money. If you're willing to work hard, you can earn money. I can get money back. can never get the time back. Look at me. Look at me. You can never get it back. When they move from 10 to 11, there'll be no more 10. And I'm telling you, listen to me from experience. It goes by. Watch my fingers. Watch how fast it goes. You're at a wedding and they're moving out. I remember, this will kind of bring a little bit of fun and then I'll land this plane. Uh, <clears throat> I remember Caden was gonna go be a welder. This has been like a year, 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 a little over a year ago. It was last uh, February, last of January. So he was moving to Utah, 19 years old. No, he was 18. Cause then he turned 19 and he'll be 20. I don't know, whatever. But here's the deal. Uh, I, he was getting ready to leave that next morning and I was gonna leave before him and he had already packed up all his stuff. And so, uh, so I was just gonna go in and give him a hug. He sleep and I go in and give him a hug. Bawling like a baby. He's like, Dad, what's wrong? <laughs> he thought I had gone psycho. <laughs> the season's gone. <laughs> it's not like I can say, Hey, when I get home from work today, oh, I'll be fine. <laughs> I, uh, we'll go get coffee. 
God. You can't get it back in. So I'm begging you, parents, listen, man, your boys need you. I know some of you own companies. And listen, I know what it takes to own a company. Okay, I'm running a business coaching. I'm running real estate. We've got the church stuff going on here. There's other things that I have dreams of wanting to do. And I, I've got the time, energy, and focus now. Listen, I know there's some of you run companies. Get a coach and figure out how to leverage your time. Your time is all that you've got that really matters. Forget about the money. In fact, you can earn more money if you leverage the time and hire people to do the stuff for you. Well, that's hard too. Well, the other way is harder. And it's going to take time to build in relationally with, listen to me, with your kids. Your kids need you. They need time with you. I know I hear dad say it all the time. Well, they're little. No, they need to connect with you when they're little. You just don't know what to do. And the wife is always around. So she enables you to not have to do anything. This is not leave it to Bieber anymore. You've got to figure out how to spend time with your kids because the only way you're going to have relational authority is to spend time with them. Learn to do stuff. Well, they do this and I don't like to do it. Learn to like it. You're the adult. I was terrible at Guitar Hero. My boys wanted me, my boys wanted me to play Call of Duty. I got dizzy. And then, and I got frustrated too because they'd be like, hey dad, look at me. And I'd turn around. I was like, I didn't see you. Where were you? I was right behind you. You want to do it again? Let's go again. No. I want to win. Take time to invest in the relationship. Here's the big idea. To parent as God does, we establish relational authority. See, the openness that results from relational authority is a must to be able to influence your, char- your child's heart. I'm going to tell you the true indicator. When they walk out that door for the last time, say bye. They now get to choose if they want to come back. And if it's been positional authority, they might not. It can be repaired, but they might not. And with all the mistakes that my wife and I've made, I keep telling you about all the mistakes so, so you don't think I'm such a failure. Uh, I'll tell you some other wins that we've had. Like our, every one of our boys, like they can't wait for us to celebrate their mom's 50th birthday on July 2nd. They, they can't wait for Thanksgiving. Now they're, Caden wants to go on a, he goes, dad, I want to go on a cruise. Absolutely, son. We're going to go on a cruise for your 21st birthday. They want to spend time with us. That's a great value, but it takes time. It takes time. And if you don't take the time today, build your business. You can build businesses when they're grown. You got to take the time. And here's how I want to end this. Jesus wants a relationship with me, like I'm telling you, that you should have with your kids. My father, my heavenly father loves me so much. See, I'm not afraid of my heavenly father. I'm not afraid of him. But I am afraid to disobey him because I don't want to disappoint him. It shouldn't be like, well, I don't want to end up in hell. That's not the kind of relationship that I want to be a part of. It's My father loves me so much. He died for me and he loved me even when I was a sinner and he drew me to himself. And I don't want to disappoint him. 
I want to spend time with him. I want a relationship with him. I want to love him. I want to get to know him better because he'll help me be a better father. So the big idea again is to parent as God does, we establish relational authority. And when we establish and we lead from relational authority, it's amazing what can happen because life is all about relationships. So what I want to do is have Pastor Tim come back up and um, I want us to just sing just a portion of um, the, the last song that we did. You belong to me. And the reason why is because I think that song speaks so much to men as it does to everybody. Like, man, if you feel like you're a failure, your identity is not a failure. Your, your identity is not in a person or, I mean, an event or, I mean, it's just, a failure is an event, not a person. And so when I sing this song, I go, man, I belong to Jesus now. And you know what's beautiful? I get to show my boys now being grandpa. And I wish I would have been with my boys. Like I am with Graham. I don't get upset. I don't pound my, I'm like, son, you better stop acting like that. Poppy is not going to be happy with you. You better straighten yourself up right now. We're not acting like that. You can cry all you want. And when I was with my kids, I'd have been screaming and yelling and hollering and getting all mad. Poppy, will you play with me? Yeah, absolutely, I'll play with you. Because I want a relationship with you and that's what I want to say to you fathers. You got to learn to spend time with your kids and play with your kids and you got to do it when they're young. And then as they get older, you do it and you figure it, figure it out and you get mentors. I've got mentors in every area of my life. And if David Hickenbotham's watching, I just want to thank him. He has poured, I've mean, got several men that have poured into my life. But David Hickenbotham has poured into my life. And helped me. And I couldn't have done it without him. So I'll quit crying. <laughs> Let you guys stand and we'll close out. And then I'll come back up and give you a couple closing thoughts. I want you to sing this like you mean it. Let all of the failure that you've had in your life just melt away. Jesus took it to the cross. Let's sing this song together. Here we go.
though the enemy can't take what I have or what I have done. Maybe as a father, you have failed. Let me say it. As a father, you have failed. <laughs> as a mother, you have failed. As a human being, you have failed. As a friend, you have failed. As an employer, you have failed. As an employee, you have failed. You have failed. You are a broken, sinful human being. But Jesus died on the cross. And when I am a child of God, my identity is found in Christ. And the enemy can't take my identity. And I'm thankful it's not like this, but I want to speak to some of you today where your kid won't come home. They won't come back. Then you do what Romans chapter 12, verse 21 says, as much as it depends on me, live at peace. You make sure that you've reconciled. You make sure that you've said what you've said. I mean, to them, make sure you've confessed your sins about them and your wrongdoing. And if they won't receive it, it's not your responsibility. I know it hurts. But it doesn't change who I am. But there's a lot of men that haven't gone to their kids and said, Dad has messed up. And I know you're scared because you think you lose your manhood. I actually believe, and I think if you look at Scripture, you actually gain your manhood. When you become a man and you become a humble man. And so let's sing it one more time. Men, I want only the men to sing. That means only men sing. Okay? Men, let's sing this. Here we go. Ready? online and in person that you would meet them in their brokenness and you would help them to realize that they can do this through your power that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and so Jesus I pray you'd help them to realize that through you they can become relational parents that what the locust has eaten and what the worm has eaten you can restore and you will restore God over time and so I pray that you would infuse hope into us today and there's a work that many of us men need to do but as we do it we'll become relational parents relational spouses we love you Jesus we thank you for today in Jesus name I pray and everyone said amen, amen.